My goal for the next hour is to make every single person in here very uncomfortable. And I say that sort of half jokingly, but it's true. What we're going to talk about today um, can be heavy and it can be dark. I'm going to tell you some deep, dark things about myself. And I hope that it stretches the limit of your comfortability because it needs to be. We need to have these discussions. I'm also going to try to make this pretty funny because if not, it just gets too heavy. So I asked for a little leeway as far as um, uh, being able to tell some jokes and whatnot, because if not, it just gets really heavy and um, difficult to talk about. So we're going to try to um, have a, a little dose of sugar along with that um, dose of, of bitter as well. So um, as Gabriel said, my name is Joshua Austin. I'm a general dentist in San Antonio, Texas. I practice every day. In fact, I'm in my office right now. I finished with patients just about 45 minutes ago. And uh, I'm, I'm you know, just an everyday restorative dentist. And um, so was my dad. Uh, my dad was a, a dentist in Amarillo, Texas for 25 years. Um, he uh, was born in Tennessee, went to dental school in Tennessee, and then joined the Air Force. The Air Force moved him to Texas and stationed him in Amarillo, where he served four years at Amarillo Air Force Base, and then decided to stay on uh, in the city of Amarillo uh, as a private practice dentist. And in 1974, he and four other doctors opened this uh, practice that you see here, the Amarillo Dental Group. Now, nowadays, a five-doctor group practice we look at and we say, oh, you know, no big deal. Every community in this country has a five doctor group practice or much bigger than that. And so um, not a big deal. But in 1974, this is a really big deal. In fact, they were the biggest dental group, uh, biggest dental group practice west of the Mississippi when this office opened in little old Amarillo, Texas, which is actually up in the panhandle of Texas, if you don't know where Amarillo is. The building still exists, although it's no longer a dental office is now a clear channel communications television studio for the city of Amarillo. And inside the office, if you were to take a look inside the office, you know, I would describe this interior design motif as classic and timeless, modern. I mean, you can't tell by looking at this picture whether it was taken in 1958 or in 2018. Obviously, I'm kidding. You can tell exactly the week in 1974 that this photo was taken. Uh, just couldn't be more 70s if you tried with this photo. Here's a view from the other uh, end of the waiting room, which is ostensibly in a different zip code because of how big this reception area is. Um, you could play a full court NBA basketball game. And that's how big a, of a waiting room this is. It's just so much wasted space. I just can't even imagine. This next photo is my second favorite photo of the entire series. This is my dad's office manager, Georgia. Uh, Georgia was the epitome of a sassy Southern woman. Um, she had that beehive haircut from 1958 until the day she died in 2004. And she was a woman that would say things like kiss my grits unironically. Um, she was just, uh, I can hear her voice in my head as I see this picture. It makes me miss her every time I see it. And if you look behind her back, you will see uh, Dentrix G1, just a sheet of paper where you wrote, people's names down on how anybody showed up for an appointment. I have no idea. And if you look on that chic and sexy wood paneling right behind her, you will see mounted on that. Um, what was the height of dental technology at the time? That was the iTero 5D plus the Serac prime scan. That's right. An intercom system that was used for paging people around the office. Every time I look at these photos, I see something a little different. A couple of times ago, I was looking at him and I noticed this woman Standing back here, my, my dad was always obsessed with me being busy. He always had like me to have something to do. Um, he used to th say things like um, uh, idle hands are the devil's plaything. And uh, if you got time to lean, you've got time to clean. And uh, I look at this photo, this moment in time, frozen forever. And I see this woman, I don't know who she is, but whoever she is, she's leaning on the clock. There's, she, uh, my dad would have, would have done nothing but yell at her if he, if he would have seen this picture. Um, you know, uh, just pick up a dust cloth and, and, and wipe this, this down. If this was me leaning on the clock, then uh, I would have been, you know, dead meat from my dad's perspective. This is the other office manager, uh, Debbie. Say what you will about Georgia being stuck in the 60s. Debbie in 1974 here with her permed haircut and cut off sleeves is ready for Def Leppard to pour some sugar on her on the hood of a Camaro. I mean, she is ready for the 80s. You could not have a bigger diametrically opposed group than these two, Georgia and Debbie. They got along famously, but they uh, obviously had different styles. This is something I don't have in my office. 
a dental or a, a library. I mean, I do have, you know, a library in the sense that I have Google, but in 1974, they didn't have Google. So you needed like a physical library in your office with textbooks and, you know, uh, uh, journals and all of that, that, that if you look on that back countertop there, that is not a computer that is microfiche. So they would look up journal articles. Microfiche used to be like little transparencies about the size of a, of an index card or a, 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 a three by five uh, picture. And uh, it would have an entire year of journal articles shrunken down really, really, really small. And that thing was basically like a microscope that would magnify them so you could see them. And uh, again, there's something on that conference table that I don't have in my office, an ashtray, just in the middle of a dental office inside that makes the next room make a little bit more sense uh, on the architectural plans. This next room was called the smoke and coffee break room, which is exactly what is happening in this room. Uh, we have our uh, admin assistant here is taking a little break uh, with a cup of Sanka and a pack of Virginia Slims inside of a dental office. I just can't even imagine this. Uh, I can't imagine like having a tough extraction on number three and then telling my hygienist, like, I'll be right in there to do the exam. I'm going to go blow out a marble red. I'll be right there. Like, I, and then go in and do the exam with, uh, you know, ungloved hands that just smoked a, a marble red just wild stuff. What must this dental office have smelled like? What, what does eugenol mixed with camels smell like? That's what it smelled like inside this place. I love the uh, wallpaper in this room. Uh, nothing like putting a really loud wallpaper in a really small room, then putting a mirror in it to make it feel like you're in a circus fun house. And then somehow, some way finding chairs that match that wallpaper. So you never know for sure if you're actually sitting down on anything. It's a surprise every time you walk in there. Um, here is one of the operatories. And I just love everything about this room. It couldn't be more 70s. I mean, it, the chocolate brown delivery system, I just love it. Um, I love the phone in the operatory that's ostensibly right by the patient's head. When the patient's head is reclined, who is this phone for? Is the phone for the patient? Is the phone for my dad? Is he packing amalgam and talking on the phone? I've spent my entire career trying to get the phone out of an operatory um, in specifically like my dental assistant's iPhone. Here's my dad just like, hold my beer. I'm going to be the first one to put a phone in the operatory, right? Um, I don't, if any of you are building a new office, um, that delivery system does come in red if you are interested, um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're building out uh, some new rooms. Um, and, and I have seen the catalog from this furniture um, from 1974, Pelton Crane. And I, I do know it came in one other color that's not pictured here, not chocolate brown and not red. That's right, avocado green. But we can't put avocado green furniture on red carpet. This place is classy. We can't have everybody thinking it's Christmas all the time in here. Come on. Um, and this next photo is my favorite photo of the entire series. This is my dad. Um, and I, I just, I wish I knew what the photographer said to him before they took this photo in order to elicit this response from him. The only thing I can imagine he is asking the photographer, who the heck picked red carpet? Because I cannot look at this photo without thinking of one thing. It's a movie from the 70s. You guys are thinking of it too. That's right. The Shining. This office has real shining vibes going on here with that red hallway. Um, and if I told you, and this is true, that every single room down that hallway was a hygiene operatory. If I had to get up every hour to do that many hygiene checks, I would break down the doors with an ax as well, screaming, here's Johnny, just like Jack Nicholson did in The Shining. I mean, you know, I know they did a lot of drugs in the 70s, but I feel like it took a pretty specific mescaline high for them to think that this design choice was a good idea. I guess the upside is with red carpet is if you're extracting a tooth and you drop it on the ground, like you just kick it off to the side. You can't stain it, nothing can stain it. So um, I guess that is an advantage of the red carpet. But again, real shining vibes. Um, I don't know why all of you got into dentistry, but for me, it was my dad. And I know that many dentists became a dentist uh, or got into the dental industry because one of their parents was also a dentist, a common, path of entry into the dental field. In fact, my patients ask me all the time, apropos of nothing, if my dad was a dentist, which I find kind of insulting because in my head, I automatically translate that question into why the heck would you want to do this every day if you weren't pressured into it by a helicopter parent? I know that's not what they're saying, but that's what I hear in my head. Now, I certainly wasn't pressured into this by my dad, but he is the reason that I became a dentist. And today it's clear to me that I wanted his approval. I became a dentist because I wanted to make my father happy. I wanted to hear that he's proud of me, something that probably everyone wants to hear from our parents. We're, we're hardwired to seek out that kind of approval. There's just one problem. 
I will never be able to get that kind of approval from my father. My father died when I was 10 years old and I've been chasing a ghost for the last 30 years. In fact, I never even got the chance to tell him I wanted to become a dentist. And now as an adult, I realize that it sounds crazy to try to work for his approval without him even being around to give it. But it's taken a long time for me to figure that out. There's always been an emptiness. There's always been a void, something missing from my life. And I've tried to fill that void with all sorts of things, cocaine, escorts, base jumping. I'm obviously kidding. I've never been base jumping. Achievements. Achievements is what I've tried to fill that void with, but it's never filled the emptiness. Ever since I was 10, I've tried to do things that I thought would make my dad proud because I thought it would make me feel better. When I was in dental school, I ran for and became class president like a G. Didn't make me feel any better. My class voted on me to give the speech at dental school graduation, killing the game. Didn't make me feel any better. I even ran for the, tech, the uh, uh, board of directors for the Texas Dental Association because I once found a 30-year member pin in my dad's desk drawer. And I won the election. And then I had to serve for three years going to 10 meetings a year. I didn't want to do that. It was terrible. Look at this picture. This is the least diverse group of people in the world in this room. I'm like Benjamin Button in the bottom left-hand corner, aging backwards. In the agenda book at every meeting at 1030, it would say, reminder, all board members, please take your Lipitor. I'm like, bro, I listened to Kanye on the way over here. What am I doing? What an insane thought process looking back on it, thinking that that would make me feel better about myself. I mean, it would be like finding a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader calendar in my dad's office and then deciding to try out for the squad and then making it and then having to be a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. Those outfits don't look comfortable. I can't fill out that bus like that. I mean, I may be a B cup, but that needs a solid D to get that done. I can't walk in those boots. I can't do those leg kicks. What am I doing? None of it ever filled the emptiness. And what I didn't realize is that I started to resent dentistry for not filling that emptiness that could ever be filled the way I wanted it to anyway. And I'm gonna leave this on the screen just for a few seconds so you can you know, have this etched into your nightmares for later. Uh, I started to wear that resentment more outwardly and I couldn't tell, but the people around me could and I don't just mean my team members. Um, we use this software for reactivations in our practice. If a patient hasn't been in 18 months, it sends them an email or a text and tries to get them to book a recall appointment. And they can opt out and when they opt out, it gives them a little exit interview, asking them, why are you opting out? And one of the things they can choose is that they are seeking care elsewhere. And then it sends us an email so we can deactivate the patient and not bug them anymore. And so one morning I came into my office, um, got there before everyone else, checked the office email, and I found this response from Chris. Chris is seeking care elsewhere because I quote, Dr. Austin just seems so angry all the time. This shocked me because I thought I was a great actor. I thought I was Daniel Day-Lewis putting on a great show every day for my patients and I thought they loved it and I thought they loved me. And it turns out they could tell. It turns out I wasn't such a great actor. Patients could sense it. They could sense my unhappiness and I could not continue to let that happen. Maybe Chris is right. Maybe I do have an anger problem. This is one of the walls in my private office and I can't even remember what set me off enough for me to punch a hole through the sheetrock of my office wall. I realized I needed help. This helped me realize that I needed to talk to somebody. I needed to talk to somebody professionally. And because of how I'm wired, my first thought was to look on Yelp. Makes sense, right? Best cheeseburger, go to Yelp. Best sushi, Yelp. Best mental health professional equipped with unique skills to help you improve your relationships and keep you from jumping off the roof of your dental building every morning, Yelp. So. I went to the two top rated therapists in San Antonio, and it turns out they're so highly rated because all they do is sit back and listen to you talk and never challenge you on anything. I looked on Google, same thing, nothing was a good fit. In desperation, I checked out Tinder. Turns out a great place to meet people with mental health issues, just not mental health professionals to help you with your mental health issues. I, uh, no, I didn't go to Tinder. 
And I didn't go to Grinder either. I know what you're thinking about this pattern jacket. It's not true. Um, I actually ended up going to the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy Find a Therapist page. They have a really nice area on their Find a Provider tool where therapists can list their philosophies and specialties. And I wanted a therapist who specialized in previous trauma, the loss of my dad. And after some research, I found Brittany, who has been amazing. And I immediately trusted her and connected with her. And one thing I love about Brittany is she likes to check in with me over text in between our sessions. And I really like this because sometimes I'm able to be a little bit more honest over text. And that gives us something to talk about at our next session. Let me show you an example of one time that this really helped me. My therapist, Brittany, checked in on me one day and we had the following exchange. How are you feeling today? Tough day. Seems like I've been having a lot of issues getting my team on board with what I want them to do. Huh, that's interesting. Is there one team member that seems to be the problem? That's a good question. Let me think about it. You've mentioned your office manager before. Is it her? No, it's not her. Is it your dental assistant who has been calling in sick recently? No, she's been much better. It's actually someone I've never blamed for anything before. Who is that? I think the problem is me. And I'd be lying if I said that wasn't hard to type. That is a great insight. Now we have some great work we can do. In a short 15 minutes, you've already seen me show one example of my anger problems. This isn't an instant cure. It's not an extraction of an abscess tooth where there's immediate relief. It's a process. It's about progress and not perfection. Day by day, week by week, my team notices a difference. My friends notice it. Hopefully my patients and my family notice it too. Am I saying that everyone needs therapy? No, of course not. Just every dentist needs therapy. And I say that half jokingly, but I do think it's kind of true. We all have a very similar personality type and I'm hearing more and more and more about dentists that are having issues with their mental health all the way from depression, anxiety, all the way to suicide every single day. And I don't wanna hear it anymore. I want us all to get better and to be more comfortable talking about this. Um, I do think that everyone could benefit from an objective third party that gives you feedback to your complaints about your life and your relationships and helps you see things through different perspectives. And through my talk today, I'm hoping that I can get you to understand the importance of that as well. Because when we are right, we are better clinicians. When we're right, we are better leaders in our practice. When we're right, we are better family members, better husbands and wives and sons and daughters and fathers and mothers, right? So that's what I want. I want dentistry to take a step forward here. I wanna talk for a second about pessimism and optimism, right? Um, because we've all heard that good things happen to optimists, right? And bad things happen to pessimists. And we're taught to think that it's just as simple as changing your mind. Are you a pessimist? Well, that's why bad things happen to you. You need to change your mindset. And I see it all the time on social media, what I call toxic positivity, right? We all know these people that post these toxically positive things all the time. And we know that it's not just as easy as changing your mind. It's not that simple. I want to start by having you think of someone in your life that's an amazing optimist. We all have somebody in our life that... Um, always sees the bright and sunny side of things, that is always smiling, that is always having a good time. Um, and I want you to think about that person, right? And for me, it is Kirk Barron. Kirk Barron is a consultant, practice consultant, speaker, coach. Um, he has a website called Act Dental Consulting and a consulting business called Act Dental Consulting. Um, and he uh, has done a lot for dentistry over the years. Um, and he's an amazing optimist. He's always positive, he's always upbeat. He always seems to have a smile on his face and I'm just not that way. In fact, I remember the first time I ever saw Kirk Barrett speak. It was September of 2011. Kirk came to my study club in San Antonio and I was not in a good place in my life at that moment. I was in a crappy marriage where we were both pretty miserable. I was about two years into a dental startup that wasn't growing as quickly as I'd hoped. And I was pretty low on this particular day. And here came Hurricane Kirk with gale force winds of positivity and good vibes. In fact, in August of 2012, there was actually a Hurricane Kirk. Did it pick up cows and mobile homes and strew them across the Great Plains in a fit of biblical rage? No, not Hurricane Kirk. Quickly weakened and never even made landfall and then merged with another frontal system to prove its low self-esteem. 
I was just not feeling it on this particular day. And as the day went on, my mood worsened and worsened. Why can't I be that positive? What is wrong with me? How can this guy have this much energy? If I had this much energy, all my problems would be gone. My brain must just be broken. And I distinctly remember leaving Santerra Country Club that day with about a thousand pounds of self-doubt on my shoulders. I felt like Atlas in that moment. If Atlas were super into baseball and the great British baking show. That evening I got home from work and my then wife and I decided that instead of our nightly arguing, we would argue and then go to a movie. You know, a special night, a date night, as we called it, um, where we did something besides just arguing it. Well, and before I tell you what movie we went to see, um, I do want to go over with you what our choices were on that particular day in September of 2011. Now, I didn't remember this offhand. I had to go back and look it up. But uh, here is a list of movies that were playing on that night in September of 2011. We could have seen Bucky Larson, Born to be a Star. What better way to improve your mood than to see comedian Nick Swartzen in this romp that is currently sitting at 3% on Rotten Tomatoes? One critic wrote in his review, this is a severely misguided and inept comedy incapable of telling a single joke properly. Ouch, I feel that. Second thing we could have seen was Sarah Palin, you betcha. This is a Sarah Palin documentary that covers her rise from red flannel to that red dress suit and then back to red flannel. Again, this is somehow sitting at 32% on Rotten Tomatoes and one critic wrote, and I quote, at least it's not Bucky Larson. Fair enough. Another option was a movie called Backdoor Channels. Now, I know what you're thinking. Exactly what kind of creepy movie theaters did Josh and his insufferable ex-wife patronize? First off, it was as much my fault as it was hers. Secondly, no, we did not go to theaters filled with shady dudes and trench coats. I should probably tell you the title of the movie and show you the poster so you know what I'm talking about. It's Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. It's about the 1978 Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel. But no, you had to let your mind wander because you think I'm some kind of freak. Don't let it happen again. We also could have seen The Weird World of Blowfly. Oh my God, you're doing it again, aren't you? You're thinking I'm a freak again, right? No, this was a documentary about Miami jazz singer Clarence Reed. Eesh. So we had a solid two and a half choices there, but I was attracted to another movie released that day. A movie where the characters had to suffer more than if they had to sit through a Bucky Larson marathon. A movie called Contagion. It's a movie about what it would be like if a lethal novel virus were transferred from a bat to humans and spread around the globe like wildfire killing millions. So, you know, a science fiction flick. Uh, Contagion is sitting at 85% on Rotten Tomatoes and about 99.99999% accuracy on the prediction scale. So a solid lighthearted story about a deadly global pandemic seemed like just the cure for my malaise that night. I was so unhappy that I actually was jealous of some characters in the movie. You see, everyone in the movie was freaking out. And um, I remember thinking, how great would it be if a deadly virus, like the MEV1 virus, came along and took care of all my problems? It'd be so simple, right? Just get this virus and all my problems would be gone. I wouldn't have to wake up and deal with it anymore. Now, if that type of thinking sounds crazy to you, congratulations. You don't suffer from depression. But for anybody watching today who has dealt with depression personally, then you probably won't be shocked by that sentiment. And yes, I totally agree that my depression was veering uh, into narcissism when I thought that the best solution to my problem was having a virus wipe out wide swaths of the human population. And now that we've actually lived through a pandemic, I feel even more horrible about this thought. I mean, why should millions of others have to suffer and die simply because my brain can't see the bright side of things? But a bigger question is, why did my brain turn Kirk Barrett's relentless optimism and positivity into a bizarre, malicious, pandemic suicide fantasy? Was the answer to my problems that I needed to choose to be happy? It, is it really as simple as just making a choice about how we think or feel? 
science tells us it's actually not simple at all. And that actually a lot of this has a genetic basis. So studies like this have been done in all levels of mammals from rats to dogs to primates. And the conceit of the study is devastatingly simple. It starts with a group of animals, in this case, rats, um, uh, but it, it works in, in, in dogs and primates too. And they teach them classical Pavlovian conditioning, right? They teach the subject that when a certain tone of music plays, that food comes out of a dispenser. And then they teach the animals that when another distinctly different tone or musical note plays, that no food comes out. And so for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, they enforce this behavior with classic Pavlovian conditioning. And then after that behavior is in, uh, you know, is, is, is in the conscience of, of the subjects, then they start to begin to play a third note that's mathematically right in between those other two notes. And what they find is that half of the subjects, no matter how big the population, half, will go to check the chute because the tone they heard was not the bad note. And the other half will never even bother to go check the chute because the note they heard is not the good note. So basically, we have half of animals without higher thinking capabilities, except for maybe some of the primates and the monkey studies that have an optimism and pessimism that's ingrained into their uh, base, their basilar instincts, right? So it's not as simple as just changing your mind. Now, the difference between optimism and pessimism is really just our outlook on life. Does that mean that no optimists get depression? Absolutely not. There are optimists that get depression um, all the time. And does that mean that all pessimists have depression? No, not at all. Not all pessimists are depressed. But my therapists have told me in the past, at least anecdotally, that people who are pessimists are more likely to be depressed. So this seems like there's maybe some genetic predisposition here that, that um, can lead to some problems later on in life. Am I just telling you it's as simple as reading an inspirational quote and becoming an optimist? No, obviously not. Like it's much more complicated than that. As is depression, it's more than just making a choice to not be sad anymore, right? We're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. How does this apply to dentists? Well, if you look at the CDC, and I don't want to get into a debate about the CDC, think what you will of the CDC, but I do think they're pretty good at stuff like this, which is um, categorization of data. Their data says that dentists are two and a half times more likely to die by suicide than the general population. So two and a half times, 2.5 times. How about this study from the Journal of Deviant Behavior, which has quickly become my favorite journal that I uh, read every month. It's just such a page turner. This one says that being a dentist increased one's risks of suicide by 564%. 564%. It's a massive number. Again, it's probably somewhere in between those two, two and a half times to, to you know, 5.6 times. Somewhere in there is probably the true number. Either way, it's way higher than the general population. Um, how about this from the ADA? Dentists have double the rate of diagnosed depression, anxiety disorder, and panic attacks in the general population. And these are self-reported numbers. So you know that those numbers are low. People are always going to err on the side of saying that everything is peachy keen when asked in a survey. So it's probably more like two and a half times more than the general population. The British Medical Journal did this study in 2016 that showed that 90% of dentists report musculoskeletal pain most or every day. You cannot be um, in a good mood if you're in pain. Pain equals bad mood, pain equals depression, right? And as dentists, we are predisposed to hurting musculoskeletally which leads to all sorts of things from um, addiction issues uh, with opiates and other pain medications and all the way to depression, anxiety, and panic attacks. How about this study from the ADA that shows that 38% of dentists are frequently or always worried. 34% of dentists are frequently or always physically or emotionally exhausted. Physically or emotionally exhausted. And this study was done in 2016. So that's pre-COVID. What do you think it is now? Yeah, I mean, we're all worried all the time now. We're all exhausted all the time now in just the day-to-day -day management of a business during a pandemic, right? So those numbers are obviously higher now than they've ever been. 
when we think about um, terminology, when we think about diagnoses, diagnoses are really important. And fortunately in dental school, we're not really taught these. And all of the mental health diagnoses, all those definitions come from a textbook called the DSM. Um, the DSM-5 is the currently accepted um, uh, textbook or, or manual of this, the, um, the, 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 basically the Bible that mental health professionals look to to describe various diseases. So think of like the American College of Prosthodontists, their glossary of prosthodontic terms. This is sort of the mental health version of that, right? These are the official definitions of diagnoses right, and the official um, uh, qualifications that a patient must meet to be diagnosed with any number of, of mental health things. And so this is a nice little um, uh, graphic here that shows a few things, that number one, there are mood disorders um, on the high end of things, so um, we would call that mania, right, and mood disorders on the low end of things, which would be obviously depression, right, and both of those can be equally devastating and a combination of the two, which is called bipolar disorder, is also equally as devastating as well. What I want you to see here is a couple of things, is that um, a, a normal mood swing or a normal change in mood uh, or a change in mood is normal. I think what the difference is, is when something is diagnosable, when there's actually disease process involved, is when we have big swings back and forth, as we would find in a bipolar. Um, and as far as like, having depression goes, like everybody has a bad day, right? Everybody has a down couple of days. The key for it to be, uh, go from just being down for a few days to actually having clinical depression or major depressive disorder is that it has to last for two weeks or more, right? So there is a time span on this. Um, the same thing is true of mania, right? For it to be a, uh, we all have up days, we all have great days where we're feeling like a million bucks. Um, but when that lasts for more than a week, that's a, a, a manic uh, uh, episode, right? And the problem with manic episodes is they dysregulate our sleep cycle um, and they exhaust all of the neurochemicals and neurotransmitters in our brain and they inevitably lead to a crash, right? And so um, it's really that there are ups and there are downs that are both diagnosable, um, but at the end of the day, it depends on how high the peak is or how low the, the um, nadir is and how long are the stretches in between? How long are these episodes lasting? And that's how um, a lot of these are defined. Um, in my three hour program of this, we spend a lot of time getting into the various diagnoses that you may run into, um, partly to make us better clinicians because we see patients with these issues all the time. And the other thing to keep in mind is that all of these things, all of these disorders, every mental health disorder, has a chemical basis in disease, right? We know that diabetes has a chemical basis in disease, right? We know it, we learn about it. We learn all about it and not just in general pathology, but in oral pathology. And then again, in periodontics, we learn about the chemical basis of disease and diabetes over and over and over and over. And then we talk about depression as if it's just being sad, but there's a chemical basis in depression as there is in every other mental health uh, disease, just like there is diabetes. And that's one thing that we as dentists have a really hard time with because we aren't taught it. Right. And quite frankly, like when I was in dental school, we didn't know as much about it as we do now. So I, I think even if, even if our professors wanted to teach us, I don't, maybe they didn't have the tools or the time to do it. These are all the chemicals that are involved in, um, our brain health, right. Our, our mental health. And some of these things you may recognize like GABA, right, which is a key inhibitory uh, transmitter, neurotransmitter in our brain. Um, that's what benzodiazepines and alcohol hit. They enhance the actions of GABA, which turn down the volume of all our action potentials and all the signals in our brain, right? Um, and then you look down to like monoamines, like these, these are the, the heavy hitters, right? Epinephrine, norepinephrine, histamine, dopamine, and serotonin, right? Like those are the areas, those are the centers where many of our drugs work, right? Right in there. Um, you know, uh, if you look at our gazotransmitters, you see nitric oxide. I hear air, uh, airway dentists talk about nitric, nitric oxide all the time, about how nasal breathing stimulates nitric oxide release into our, into our brain and into our smooth muscle, which helps our airway, right? If you look at peptides, endorphins, right? We get that from exercise. Um, endorphins make us feel amazing, right? Um, and then oxytocin, what is oxytocin also known as? 
the love chemical, right? When there's oxytocin in our brain, we feel warm feelings of love. And I don't think it's any mistake that oxytocin is a smooth muscle dilator, actually stimulates the uterus to start labor, right? And in uh, when we're trying to induce labor, OBGYNs give Pitocin, which is synthetic oxytocin. So oxytocin starts the labor process, right? And that labor process results in what? A baby. And so what's the one way that we know that um, evolution will make sure that that baby is cared for? Well, oxytocin starts the process. And when oxytocin is high in your bloodstream, you tend to love. And so for women who have had babies, that moment where you have that baby chest to chest for the first time and that feeling that washes over you, I know it's, you know, a, a million poems have been written about it. And, and at the end of the day, it's oxytocin, right? Oxytocin is a reason that that bond exists. Um, another great way to get oxytocin released into your bloodstream is by petting a dog. Petting a dog has been scientifically proven to release oxytocin into your brain. Not as much oxytocin as having a baby, obviously, but um, it's still a good way to trigger a little oxytocin. So um, all of these things, this is an intricate dance of these chemicals in our brains. And so it's no wonder that when something goes wrong, we have issues, right? Except we don't have that same stigma about diabetes or about hypertension or about hyperlipidemia, but we do have a stigma about this, right? Oh, you're depressed, you're sad, snap out of it, right? That's not how it works. There's a chemical basis in disease. And unless we fix it, things don't get better. There's physiology behind this. And if you look at the top 200 medications that are given in this country, these are all of the top 200 that are for one mental health disorder or another. And I'm going to count these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 26 out of the top 200. That's more than 10% of the medications in the top 200 treat mental health diseases. Look at the, the first three on this list are all SSRI, sustained serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Serotonin is a mood modulator, modulates our mood and our sleep cycle. It's hugely important in both of those things. And people who are depressed don't have as much serotonin in their brain because it gets sucked back up into the cells too quickly. So SSRIs help prevent that. So there's more free floating serotonin in the brain of someone taking one of these. These drugs, SSRIs in particular, many of them cause dry mouth. Many of them cause bruxism. In fact, bruxism is the number one side effect for SSRI and SNRI medications. SNRI stands for serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And that's a newer generation of antidepressants. The first SSRI came out in 1993. It was called Prozac. Since then, we have have, you can see here, probably five or six that are on the top 200, Prozac obviously isn't used as much anymore as uh, Lexapro, Selexa, and Zoloft are, um, but SSRIs were that original um, uh, next level antidepressant. And then more recently, SNRIs have come out like Effexor and um, uh, uh, Cymbalta, right? And some of those. Uh, and so those uh, are, are newer forms of that medication that also work in the norepinephrine. norepinephrine uh, channels as well, right? And so uh, number one side effect of SSRIs and SNRIs are, is bruxism. And so when you look in the medical literature about what to do about uh, SSRI induced bruxism, um, big high level studies all recommend adding Buspar or Buspirone to the regimen, another psychotropic drug. Not anywhere in these big systematic reviews and meta-analysis is there any mention about consulting with a dentist or a night guard or an occlusal splint. So you need to be doing a full TMJ evaluation on your patients who are taking SSRIs because many of them are bruxing. You need to know that for our restorations and we need to know that for their joint health and their occlusion. And many of these patients need night guards. So if you take nothing else from this than to think about making night guards on your patients on SSRIs, I think you'll be doing them a great service. I think just the idea of throwing on another psychotropic medication is wild to me. It's totally insane. Um, uh, another uh, common side effect is dry mouth. And, and um, several years ago, it's been a while, um, I was working um, as an associate in another dental office and 
my room was uh, the closest, my room that I would do operative out of was the closest to the hygiene rooms. And I uh, would oftentimes hear the hygienist talking to the patients like while well, I was packing cord or doing something that didn't involve a handpiece. And so there wasn't a lot of volume going on. I could hear the conversations that, that were going on. Um, and I distinctly remember a conversation between a patient and my hygienist, the, the patient told the hygienist they were taking a, a new drug, it was an SSRI. Um, and the hygienist said, you know, when your mouth feels drier today, um, uh, how, does it, how does medication make you feel? Uh, and the patient said, I, I feel great. I've never, you know, I feel like me again, is what the patient said. And the hygienist said, yeah, this dry mouth's not great though. You should talk to your doctor about switching medications. And in retrospect, I look at that and like, it's just such a bafflingly wrong way approach to look at this because if a patient is taking a drug for their mental health and it's making them better, I'm not worried about the side effects. That's not to say I'm not worried about xerostomia, but we can treat xerostomia, right? We can have the patient drink water, take any number of xerostomia treating pro uh, 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 products that are on the market. They can, you know, do this every once in a while. Like we can treat the xerostomia. I'm much more concerned about the side effects of depression, one of which is death. And I only know one person, a Jewish guy, who overcame that. Dry mouth, achy joints, bruxism, all those things I can deal with. Diarrhea, I, I would be able to deal with. Do you know how much more productive diarrhea is than depression? At least with diarrhea, you can get out of bed. Erectile dysfunction, right? I would take erectile dysfunction and diarrhea if it meant that I could smile at a sunset again. Because I, I would stand there in my soiled underwear, flaccidly smiling at the sunset because at the end of the day, a sunset's a reason to live, right? Depression is a reason to die. So we'll deal with the side effects. I think we should never, ever recommend to a patient that they ask their doctor about changing medications that work for depression, anxiety, panic attacks, any of those type of things because of things like dry mouth or bruxism. Treat the xerostomia, treat the bruxism but let's not touch the thing that's treating their depression. So a, a, a little bit of a rant there, but even things like um, that you see on here, like uh, that treat um, ADHD, like stimulants, right? Um, also dry mouth and bruxism on those as well. So lots of, of oral sequela come from taking these medications, but they are all things that we can deal with if they are successfully treating the patient because the disease is far worse than the side effects. I want to talk for a second about triggers. I don't mean like gun gun triggers. I mean emotional triggers, right? Um, things that cause something to happen or exist. And an emotional trigger is something that makes us uncomfortable, highlights our self doubt, um, refreshes all our frustrations about ourselves, and can send us into a spiral of depression or anxiety, right? And so I think spending some time to learn what your triggers are, I think, is really important. Here are mine. I, clinical failures trigger me. Um, there are plenty of people in this world, uh, plenty of dentists, clinicians who clinical failures obviously don't cause them any mental anguish at all. They do me. Um, we have to learn how to deal with those, right? Social media is something that triggers me. We're going to talk about in just a second. Getting a bad Google or Yelp review is something that triggers me. And that's a whole course on how to deal with that. I don't like disorganization and clutter. I don't like running behind. But both of those things are probably things I can't 100% take care of probably things I'm going to run into in my life. And so I need to learn how to deal with those things better. Um, I talk about social media. Of all of those things, I think the only one that you can really avoid if it is a trigger of yours is social media. And I think social media can be a real problem for us. Um, I, I write a lot of articles and, and this is the best article I ever wrote is for a web, website called dentalhacks.com. It was called Porn for Your Practice. Make yourself miserable with social media. And, and I do find it kind of ironic that the best thing I've ever written has the title porn in it. Um, my mom is very proud. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, but this was basically about what happens when you look on Instagram. And more specifically, when you follow a bunch of dental Instagram accounts that only post perfect, beautiful dentistry. But the same holds true for your friends who only post all their perfect, beautiful pictures of their family, their husband, their wives, their uh, perfect car, their perfect house, their perfect workout routine, their perfect meal plan, their perfect abs, uh, their perfect vacation to Aspen, all of those things, right? And every time uh, that we scroll through social media, um, we end up uh, judging ourselves too harshly. I'm not as beautiful as that person. 
wow, that guy's in much better shape than I am. Wow, I could never do veneers like that. Wow, um, look how beautiful that endo looks. I could never do that. Um, you just end up insulting yourself over and over and over as you scroll your feed. And next thing you know, this thing that you went to is like this like little fun thing to break up your day or to have a few minutes to yourself ends up giving you all this negative reinforcement about yourself. And you end up disliking yourself even more and feeling worse about yourself afterwards. I mean, it's gotten to the point where I think we're, we're kind of all addicted to this thing, right? I mean, um, I, I know I am. And, and I have a video that proves it. This is nest cam footage of my backyard uh, of me taking my dogs out to go to the bathroom one morning. And I'm 40 years old. I don't know why my pajamas are the pajamas of an 80 year old. I just need that Ebenezer Scrooge sleep, like floppy sleep hat to like really complete the look. But what am I doing? I'm on my phone, right? I should be watching the dogs, making sure you go to the bathroom. I'm not, and something bad is about to happen. Oh my God, no. The phone just dropped in the pool. All right, take a deep breath. The, the net is just over on this other side here. Just go grab the net. We're going to net that out and everything's going to be fine. No, 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 no. What are you doing? No, 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 no. What are you doing? No, 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 no. Stop. Please stop. Please stop. Okay. Yeah. Take off the shoes. Now stop. Oh God. No. Oh my God. No. Oh God. This is bad. This is so bad. Please stop there. Please don't go any further. Oh my God. No. Oh, go, oh, oh my nice dive. Greg Luganis. The Russian judge gave that a three and a half. All right, we've got the phone. All right. Oh yeah, shake it. That'll make it work. Oh, blow on it like it's Super Mario Brothers from 1984. That'll get it to boot up. Let's get it inside to some rice. That is addict behavior. That is how addicts act when they need a hit of their drug. That's what this has become. Have you guys ever seen that app called Screen Time that shows you where you spend time on your phone? I think it's an interesting little deep dive into our psyches. Here's mine. Listen, don't judge me. Have you ever had that unlimited salad and breadsticks? Whew. I mean, when you're there, you're family. Listen, I think Instagram's fine. Instagram's great, but it does bring out some pretty, you know, insightful behaviors in us. I, a lot of you know this guy, uh, uh, Dr. Bill Dorfman from um, Extreme Makeover, uh, the Zoom whitening system. And, and, you know, he's a legend in, in cosmetic dentistry for a long time. And, uh, you know, um, 1.3 million followers. And, you know, when you go check out his feed, yeah, he posts a lot of, of teeth, but he also posts stuff like this. This is a 65 year old man posting this kind of stuff. And like, that's a very, you know, normal, healthy behavior for a 65 year old man. I don't want to call it Bill Dorfman too much, especially because I'm really into fitness and influencing as well, if you didn't know about it. And um, it just doesn't look as good on me, you know, just doesn't look as good on me. Um, Listen, I think it's a great thing to set app timers on your phone. There's no reason to, sport, to spend more than an hour on social media a day. In fact, my rule is, is that I spend as many minutes a day on social media as I spend working out. So if I want more time on social media, then I get to get on the treadmill for longer, right? Or lift weights for longer. And so I set a timer on my phone to make sure that I don't go over that time limit. Um, if you have an Android, the way that you do this is you go to the Apple store and buy an iPhone no one likes that green dot in the group text message anyway. So just get an iPhone, go to um, settings, then go to screen time, and then go to turn on screen time, and it's going to allow you to set an app timer. And I really think spending more than an hour a day on Instagram isn't healthy. I think probably that's even too much. What are you afraid of missing? Your hot astrology memes? I mean, come on. Most of it is junk on there anyway. Your life will be just as fulfilling and just as fine if you put a limit on how much time you actually spend on social media every day. It's not good for our brains. I want to talk for a second about therapy. Therapy has been really important for me. Having a safe space to talk about the events of your life and your feelings with someone you can trust and can give honest feedback, I think is important. And I think every dentist could benefit from that because we deal with so much. We have so much on our plates. Having someone on your professional team to help you keep your mind right is vital. And there's a ton of research on therapy and benefits. Number one, develop healthy coping skills. We as dentists are notorious for having terrible coping skills. Think about coping skills that dentists typically have. Addiction issues, sex, eating bad food, right? Fast food, junk food, fatty food, whatever it is. Those are our coping skills as dentists. That's how we deal with things. 
And that's not a healthy way to go through life and therapy can help you with that. Helps you process previous big T traumas and little T traumas. Um, we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's made me more empathetic, which has made me a better listener. That makes me a better leader, not just amongst my team and my practice, but with my patients as well and at home, which because it makes me have better relationships because I'm a better listener and I am more empathetic. And that gets patients to say yes to treatment more often. So I'm more profitable now than when I was punching holes in the wall. This is a book called uh, by Bessel van der Kolk, who's basically the world's leading expert in trauma. He's a psychiatrist and MD at Tufts. Um, and this book is called The Body Keeps the Score. And one of the uh, tenets of this book is that if you don't deal with trauma, it will come out of your body in some way. And those ways are not good if we don't process our traumas. And so um, one of the studies that he cites is called this Kaiser ACEs study. This study was done in California in the Kaiser system. And basically they followed children who had early childhood trauma, early childhood traumatic events, like a parent dying, like abuse, like uh, being adopted, being put up for adoption, any number of things like that. And they followed them throughout their lives and they followed their medical record to see if those people, if those kids had an increased incidence of disease in their life. And it turns out they did. That it, uh, increase in, in autoimmune disorders, that an increase in uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Huntington's, things that we typically think of as genetic, right? Or having a big genetic component, Alzheimer's, all of those types of diseases were at a higher rate in the people that had early childhood trauma. Trauma will find a way out of your body. And whether that's idiopathic diarrhea, which happened to a great friend of mine who had diarrhea for a month, or something even worse, like early death. Dealing with trauma is important. And the way you deal with trauma is with therapy. And there's a million types of therapy, right? And I don't know what's good. Not one, I, most therapists are gonna do a combination of all different kinds of therapy or, or multiple kinds of therapy. So I don't want you to get bogged down in that. But I think the biggest thing is trying to find a therapist that can work. And so I think here are some things that are, are uh, elements of good therapy. Number one is that you are bigger than your problems and that you're empowered to change and your, and your therapist believes that you can change. Without that, um, you know, you're not gonna have a, 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 a great time. You're not gonna heal very well. You're not gonna learn new coping mechanisms. Should be collaborative. I mean, you need to have a part in this and, and helping determine what's important and what's not to your life. And there needs to be focus on some moments more than others, right? Some things are deeper traumas than others are. There needs to be a relationship. You need to have a connection. Um, and, and without that connection, you're, you're never gonna be able to open up the way that you need to with that therapist. And so I, you've seen me ha have it in here a few times, uh, trauma with a capital T and trauma with a lowercase t. Trauma with a capital T is like the death of a parent, right? Divorce, um, abuse, assault, um, a really horrible car accident, any of those things that could cause PTSD, you know, a traumatic experience in the military, armed forces, you know, seeing someone near you die, any of things like that are important. Things like this, like me at, this is my uh, age nine birthday party at the San Antonio Zoo. And this is my dad, um, who was formerly six foot seven, a division one college basketball player at the University of Tennessee, 260 pounds, right? An athlete his whole life reduced down to 160 pounds in a wheelchair, right? Because of cancer. Um, those are big T traumas and those need time to be dealt with. But little T traumas need time to be dealt with too. A little T trauma it, are those things, those awkward things that happen in your life that really only you remember. You're the only one that remembers them. There's some uh, you know, cringeworthy inducing thing that you did um, 20 years ago and you still think about it from time to time. Those are little T traumas, right? And, and um, I'll tell you about one of mine. Um, if any of you get um, robot calls on your phone all the time, like spam calls, I get them all the time. So much so that I didn't want to answer my phone anymore. And so recently I decided to take action on that. And so I downloaded this app called RoboKiller. And RoboKiller is an app that's on your phone that's supposed to intercept robot calls that, that, that they flag of coming from a call center. Like they're sensing that the caller ID is spoofed or it's a reported number that's gone into a call center. And the robo killer just intercepts the call before it ever rings on your phone on the background of your app and it deals with it so that you don't have to, to answer it. One of the ways it deals with it is it has this uh, library of pre recorded conversations that it plays for the spammer that's calling you to try to keep them on the phone longer because the longer they stay on the phone, the less people they can call. 
Um, and so it's one of those things like if you ever, if you remember answering machines, if you ever had a friend who had an outgoing answering machine message that was like, hello. And then you'd be like, hey, Brian, uh, we're going to go to B-dubs for the game tonight. Gotcha. Leave a message at the beep. And you'd be like, damn it, I fell for it again. I hate that guy. Um, that's kind of what it does, right? It has conversation and then it's spaced out so the person can re respond. And then it has a, a pre-recorded response and it just plays that. Um, and it records it and it will actually um, save that in your app so that you can go listen to it later to kind of see you know, who it was that was, was calling. And one day um, my car needed service. And so I dropped my car off at the dealership to get an oil change. And I took the shuttle back to my office and worked the morning. And about 1130, I looked down at my phone and it said, it was a notification from the RoboKiller app. And it says, we have intercepted a call from this number, um, press here to listen to it in the app. And I recognized the phone number, but I didn't know where it was. And so I listened to, uh, opened up the app, listened to what you are about to hear in horror, uh, as you will see why. Austin? Yes. Hey, Mr. Austin, it's Rosie at North Park Lexus. Are you here at the dealership? Yes. Okay, uh, I'll try to page you, so I thought I'd call you. Your car's ready. Okay. I'll come see right. me at the cashier's okay, office. Okay, hold on one second. No worries. Here's the deal. Uh-huh. You just caught me in a vocal training exercise mode. I have been training for six months to go on to America's Got Talent because I want to be a singer. And I'm looking for, like, unbiased people to listen to me sing and give me their honest and, like, heartfelt opinion. So, like, this could be kind of like the voice where you can't see me, but you can hear me and, like, give me, and you don't know me. So you can, like, give me, like, an honest opinion on whether you think my voice is nice or not. Are you cool with that? And, and yeah. just hear me, like, sing for, like, 30 seconds, give me your opinion, and then I'm all game to what, to what you need from me. Deal? Oh, I thought that you were doing that already when you were doing that. Oh, okay, ready or not, yeah. here I Go come. Hockey. Uh, and it seems to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind, never knowing who to cling to when the rain set in. And I would have burned out long before your legend ever did. <clears throat> Sorry, I was a little hoarse there, but can mm -hmm. you just like give me your honest opinion about what you thought of that? I would tell you, I would vote for you. I would give you a chance. I need a little more feedback than that. Come on. Give me the good. Well, what do you think? Do I have the heart? Do I have... Am I going to win a million dollars on America's Got Talent? Honestly, I would say you probably wouldn't win the million dollars, but you'd probably go a couple of rounds. Uh, that's a little rude. But you wanted my honest opinion. Okay. I'm you sound you good. I mean, you know, I so mean, you sound good. Me that's, why I said, that's why I said you'd probably go a couple of rounds. I mean, um, come pick up your car. Your car's ready. Okay, you know what? I have to go mm -hmm. gargle some eggs, so I'm going to cut okay. this conversation short, but thanks for listening. Oh. So my first thought at listening to that was just keep my car because this woman has my car and it will be less painful for me to just buy a new one and continue making payments on that one and just let her keep it. That's less painful than going to face this woman. Um, and obviously at some point I realized like I had to, I had to go get my car. So I took an Uber over there uh, and quite frankly, hoped that the Uber crashed the entire time. Like not to hurt the driver, just me, just, just, you know, get clipped by an 18 wheel or something like that. Just the back half of the car, not the front half. I want that guy to survive. Um, but unfortunately an accident never happened. And I arrived at the car dealership and I'll, I'll never forget the pattern of tile on the floor of the service department at this dealership. It was black and white little subway tiles and a Chevron pattern because I was staring down at my feet the entire time walking up to the desk. And I get up to the desk and there's this woman, there's Rosie. And I, for the next five minutes, try to explain to her that she was just talking to a robot on my phone who was, thought she was a scammer and tried to keep her on the phone for a long time. And it became apparent that she did not understand where this conversation was going. 
and did not understand at all what I was talking about. So at some point it was finally just like, here's my credit card. Let me get my car and get out of here. And so I pay. And as I'm walking, she's like, hey, they're going to pull your car around. You can go wait over there. As I'm walking away, she says, uh, Mr. Austin. And I turn around and she says, it's going to be a no from me, dog. I'm like, oh, God, she still thinks that's me that was singing. That's a little tea trauma, right? That woman's probably never thought of it after that day. She probably laughed at her coworkers. Ah, this guy's saying to me on the phone, never thought about it again. I think about it like every time I get into the car, right? Every time I drive by that dealership, I think about that. That's a little tea trauma. And so those are types of things that even, yes, those silly things like that do sometimes need therapy to be taken care of. At the end of the day, I think laughter and humor are some of the best ways to deal with stress, anxiety, and depression. At the end of our lives, our spirit, our essence, in my mind, boils down to the number of times that we've laughed during our lives. Laughter is the best medicine. Laughter is the cure. And laughter is literally the greatest element in the universe. And if you've um, enjoyed some of the comedy at this program, uh, you can check out the podcast that I do every week uh, called The Working Interferences. Um, that's a dental comedy show that helps, um, you know, just break up the week a little bit and all the stuff that we have to deal with. You're probably thinking to yourself, like, what the heck does chamfered psyche even mean? Truthfully, I just thought it sounded really cool. I just hit an edible pretty hard when Microdental reached out to me for a title. I'm kidding, kind of. Um, we spend so much time in dentistry focused on minutia. We refine our margins with a red stripe diamond until they are perfect chamfers. We polish our anterior composites until we can see our double chins reflecting back at us in them. We replane the cementum so clean that you could eat a plate of chicken wings off of them when you're done. But if we could just spend part of the time that we spend on our margins or polishing our composites, on our happiness and our mental health, we'd be better. We'd be happier. Our team would be happier. Our patients would be happier. And most importantly, our loved ones would be happier. And I've talked a lot today about my dad and almost nothing about my mom. And that's because I basically saved everything about my mom for this very last story, these last couple of minutes. And this story is why therapy is so vital for all of us. It helps us see things that we could never see on our own. When I was in high school, uh, I had a job as a pharmacy technician. I worked in the pharmacy at the HEB grocery store around the corner from my house. It was a super cool job because I didn't have to mow yards or flip greasy cheeseburgers. I got to work in air conditioning and in a job that was at least healthcare adjacent. And I got to wear this super cool navy blue smock that for some reason had more pockets on it than a smoker with severe perio. It turns out that when you work in a pharmacy, you end up being in charge of all of your family's prescriptions. It's just part of the job. So my mother uh, had all her meds filled at my pharmacy and I took care of all of it for her. Sort of an uneven trade when you look at it. She gave me life. I brought home her estrogen replacement pills. She provided me with shelter and nourishment. I brought home her zestral. Let's call it even, mom. I mean, I was coming home in anyway. And, you know, I did have that smock pocket or that, uh, that blue smock that had nine pockets on it. You got to put something in those pockets. Your prescriptions might as well have been it. One day I was uh, at home after school getting ready for my shift at the pharmacy. And my mom had a manicure appointment that day. And she forgot what shade of nail polish she was really into at that time. So she needed me to go in her bathroom in her medicine cabinet and tell her what shade of nail polish was there. So I went into her bathroom and I opened the medicine cabinet and I found the, the nail polish. Let's see what we have here. We have a uh, lavender spring. Oh, that, that sounds delightful. We've got, uh, oh, uh, lilac summer. I'm sensing a pattern here. Uh, and the last one, wet and wild bad girl crimson. What is this? No, I'm, I don't know what shade it was. Um, I, the shade has no meaning. What has meaning is what was next to the nail polish. It was a prescription bottle from Walgreens. That's strange. I don't work at Walgreens and I'm the one who takes care of all of my mom's prescriptions. Why is there a bottle from Walgreens? And I was stunned when I saw what was in the bottle. It was Prozac. My mother was on antidepressants. My mother was on antidepressants. I stood there frozen and stared at the bottle. My mother was on antidepressants. My mother made a decision, a conscious decision to make sure that I didn't know 
that she was on antidepressants. And this wasn't an easy conspiracy either. I mean, it wasn't like JFK or 9-11 or the moon landing, if you believe that actually happened, but it did take work. She had to get her prescription herself, take it to herself to a pharmacy that was out of the way, had no link or connection 